Welcome to a summary discussion with uh, Andreas Jeremon, who is our uh, medical advisor to Quanterix, as well as Paula Perrin, who's one of our top strategic advisors um, inside of our company application, particularly in the areas of neuro and inflammation, and Mark Roski, who actually runs most of um, the strategic relationships that we have externally with many of our thought leaders around the world and brings a lot of the scientific acumen to our company. This is um, an incredible opportunity to discuss what we think were some game-changing representations that just occurred at the um, International Symposium of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's Disease. This was a virtual conference and there was a lot of readout from both Lilly, Biogen, and many of our strategic customers that are pursuing Alzheimer's. And today's focus is primarily on Alzheimer's because we do think we're at the doorstep of some pretty um, important agent prog uh, progression in the pipeline. And Quanterix has been serving for the last four or five years in a very strategic way using our biomarkers to help explore and enhance the cohorts that are being used for these drug trials. Typically, um, our biomarkers are able to see the Alzheimer disease cascade prior to actual dementia symptoms, which gives them an opportunity for precognitive impairment biomarker assessments, which can, we think, um, give a better chance for efficacy opportunities by recruiting patients in before actual dementia symptoms. We also have some uh, newer biomarkers like PTAL-181 that also enhance and allow you to stratify out um, certain types of dementia, dementia, such as Lewy bodies dementia and frontal temporal dementia from the cohort of Alzheimer patients, further enriching and given a, a much more fertile opportunity for the, the pharmas to have an opportunity for efficacy. Um, in either primary or secondary endpoints. And this is a, an emerging field. And so this conference is a chance for many of the scientists around the world, many of the KOLs that we're tightly linked to, as well as much of the investor community to assess the progress that, that we and others are making in this uh, really Belgian field of uh, biomarker um, utilization in Alzheimer uh, drug development. So with that uh, brief introduction, I'd like to maybe start off with Paula, who actually uh, did attend most of the, uh, the presentations from um, Eli Lilly and, and um, also Biogen, and has a pretty good perspective on how um, our biomarkers are being utilized in, in very significant advancements uh, throughout the industry. So Paula, if I could turn it over to you for um, your initial comments. Sure, thank you, Kevin. And uh, uh, for me, it was really a pleasure to attend this conference. Uh, I got a chance to attend many of the sessions, not only the fluid biomarker ones that uh, were specific uh, to our, uh, basically, our field of uh, uh, expertise, but I was uh, very impressed how all of the experts really appreciate the role of plasma biomarkers. So it was not restricted to the fluid biomarker session. Basically, every live discussion, every forum I attended, there was some reference to, to plasma biomarkers, even if the session was not really dedicated to fluid biomarkers. And it seems to, there seems a sense that uh, plasma biomarkers are indeed transformative. They are game changing in the way that clinical trials will be designed. Um, the ability of uh, pre-screening participants prior to running a PET scan that it's so expensive will make trials much more cost efficient and it will also uh, accelerate. So the, the recruitment of patients, it will uh, potentially, we saw many of the talks are showing that the plasma biomarkers are performing the same as CSF biomarkers. So if we can reduce patient burden, uh, we may have also a high enrollment uh, rate. We would have less dropout rates from this trial. So I think there is a sense from these experts that uh, this will revolutionize the way that uh, uh, clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease are done. So for me, it was really a pleasure to see the, the impact uh, of, of plasma biomarkers. And we are very close to seeing more and more also in clinics. I'm talking about clinical trials, but uh, uh, directly with patients, there is also a sense that even though you may not completely replace this uh, uh, traditional ways of diagnosing Alzheimer's uh, by plasma biomarkers, it will be a very efficient pre-screening tool that you can then uh, refer these patients to more specialized centers. We all know PET scans are very useful to understand the neuropathology of AD, but they're expensive and they are not available everywhere. So definitely um, in a, like a high level overview, I saw that uh, the plasma biomarkers are here to stay. 
and in particular phosphatal, but not only like we see, including NFL, GFAP, new phosphatal forms are being uh, mentioned. And they, I believe that uh, we will not be stuck with one phosphatal form. I think we will really be able to improve the accuracy of this, uh, of this biomarkers uh, to predict um, Alzheimer's in mild cognitive impaired patients, but also to diagnose. So that, uh, that's my take on of the conference. Excellent. Paula, you know, it's um, real intriguing to just see how rapidly this field is advancing. I remember probably it was uh, three years ago, we had a Pyrene Precision Health um, 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 Symposium in Boston, and we had uh, Dr. Al Sandrock, who's the uh, chief medical officer and head of all of R&D of Biogen attending. And, and I remember him on the stage saying that he felt that Samoa at some point, probably in the next 10 years, is going to be able to see Alzheimer's long before dementia. And I think um, that caught everyone's attention um, because it's not only seeing it, but it's also seeing it in non-invasive blood samples. And as your point around enrollment, there's many trials historically that there has been trouble even recruiting patients because it required a spinal tap, which is very painful, very expensive, very invasive, or a PET scan. Again, both cost about $5,000 and there's now really good evidence in several different um, neuro neurological third-party peer-reviewed publications of very good correlations of the amyloid pathology with the PTALs, uh, particularly 181 for both um, CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, spinal tap, and the imaging. Um, so I do think that this is um, not only an advance it's occurring, but Samoa itself from Quanterix seems to be really being um, on that bleeding edge because of its sensitivity and being able to see and quantitate the level of these different biomarkers in a multiplex. And Mark, um, Mark Roski, I was curious, I know you've done a lot of work just exploring just how pervasive the Samoa technology was being represented at this particular conference. I wonder if you could make a few comments to what uh, you were able to observe and assess. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. You know, it, it was really interesting to see, as Paula pointed out, how these fluid biomarkers now are really coming of age and really being used more routinely by a number of different investigators. And there's the, the tau isoforms, there's the ability to measure A beta 40 and 42. And there's even, you know, some new biomarkers that are coming along. In particular, I was impressed as I looked through the presentations I was impressed with the ability to combine some biomarkers to really not only determine neurodegeneration early, for example, by using serum and neurofilament light biomarkers in the Samoa technology, you can see neurodegeneration really early, but then combine that biomarker with some of these phospho forms, maybe even some uh, measurements of inflammation like GFAP, and really come up with a panel of biomarkers that can not only detect early, but discriminate uh, AD from PD or other forms of uh, cognitive impairment. So I thought that was a big theme of the meeting and the several different talks and really looks like these technologies are going to start, as, as Paula pointed out, helping with uh, patient recruitment and adding real value to clinical trials. Mark, uh, you know, I was curious, you had, um, I think, done some actual statistics of how um, frequently Samoa was represented and um, was in citations and it, it appeared that we had a very large majority of, of participation from the pharmas. And that's a pretty important advance because really four or five years ago, we really weren't on the scene. And there were other companies attempting to, to make headway in this area of, of measuring fluid biomarkers. But just in the last several years, Samoa really has um, hit the stage in a very productive way and has been quite um, really the revolutionary tool because of its sensitivity. I wonder if you could comment on just how present you felt Samoa was at this conference. Yeah, when you really looked at, you know, every poster and presentation that, that looked at fluid biomarkers and their impact, and then you looked at the technology that was used for each one, uh, it turns out that significantly over half of those use Samoa technology. And I think this is really important because you start to see the importance of sensitivity and the importance of, as I mentioned before, combining particular multi particular biomarkers in multiplexes, where again, you may need some sensitivity. So, you know, the field is really coming along and Samoa is playing a major role. Perfect, Mark. And, and I think um, I also read somewhere that, that, you know, while we were in half of those um, citations, um, or even maybe better than half, 
there were still some citations, less than 25% from any single other competitor that might be trying to enter into this landscape, but also mass spectrometry, which was really the early stage way to try to bring some level of insight to the relationship between blood biomarkers and, and the you know, Alzheimer pathology. But uh, I, I found that to be a pretty revealing advance um, based on, on some of the statistics that you measured. And, and Andreas has, has been one of our, our leading independent advisors for the, really the last five years. It's actually, you know, we're very fortunate to have um, secured him to support the build out of this franchise of neurobiomarkers being used for Alzheimer drug trials. And, you know, we've made major advances to both Lilly um, and Biogen and Really, I would say, you know, J&J &J and, um, you know, we, we see a lot of opportunity, even with uh, one of our key employees uh, recently going to Takeda and Tatiana, we're really excited about her involvement now in, in Takeda. But across the field, um, Andreas, it appears that Samoa's sensitivity and the ability to democratize our measurement capability by having an HDX that goes out into the field and can, and can actually serve in laboratories for the pharma customers that are trying to build their own CLIA LDT labs, but as well as we can run our own accelerator um, inside to get started for many of these trials for the drug companies. And I was wondering, Andreas, if you could provide a little bit of perspective on the kind of role you think Samoa is playing and will play as we advance over the next um, you know, several years. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And I mean, to the point we've been making on this call, I mean, I've been seeing the field and directing the field developing over five or the last five to 10 years, and it's really come a long way. I mean, I think the issue we're having now is a good problem to have because we have so much data now. How do we really align all the data and really understand the clinical application or context of use from a regulatory perspective? Uh, I would say also from my perspective, just on a different topic, the, there's a role for mass spectrometry, but it is really is more of a discovery effort to help guide the design of the immunoassays. I think the point we're also making is that really we need a toolbox well-defined related to the pathology as we understand Alzheimer's disease now to help identify those participants, not even patients early. I think from my perspective, the excitement really lies that we're seeing this in clinical use and it's part of a developing discussion that we really need to change the way we do healthcare. And I mean healthcare, the care of the healthy, not sick care here as well. We need to detect these, these biomarkers, these initial early, what we call preclinical signs of the disease early, probably not just in the memory clinic as well. I think things get pushed out more and more potentially, not just to the general practitioner or physician, but also into the home as well. So, I mean, as part of the, uh, this, the role of Samoa, there certainly is a use in clinical use and clinical trials. We see signature based on these biomarkers now in clinical trials. So some of these drugs influence the expression of these biomarkers, but we also need to think about what the next wave is. And I think that certainly is a more point of care centered application where we can enable the assessment of these biomarkers in at a very early stage in a less clinically organizational defined measure, measure not necessarily the memory clinic. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. You know, I, I, I've also spent a lot of time in the, the last, I'd say, six months on COVID. We as a company have put a lot of uh, resources trying to support the world, um, as well as United States, and received $20 million from um, the National Institutes of Health to further ramp up some of our antigen testing. And those that lost taste and smell, as well as had precognitive or some level of cognitive impairment, have um, shown NFL levels elevated. And that has also led to a lot of concern that there could be early Alzheimer's or early Parkinson's as a result of a long hauler impact of COVID. And that's, that's created even more interest in our neuromarkers that are measuring COVID NFL, as well as now um, central to many of the, um, the multiplexes that are gonna be clinically utilized um, for measuring Alzheimer's and the effect of it. And, one of the things I've found intriguing is the payer groups are now very much interested in trying to 
further advance biomarkers within their overall testing regimen to create better outcomes. Because if they can see disease before symptoms, they have a better chance of in intervening with either drug therapies or even nutritional therapies. Nutritia is a pretty interesting Alzheimer um, advance. It's been already approved in Europe. It's now in FDA approvals. And the pair groups are saying, you know, if we can find these patients before symptoms with biomarkers, we've got a better chance of preventing or at least delaying the actual symptom of dementia in Alzheimer's or even reversing the disease. And so many of these drug trials are starting to have an opportunity to team up with the pair groups to try to recruit patients that would be pre-cognitive impairment into the trials and then also after the trials um, hopefully will be successful with all of the biomarker um, endpoints, that the pair groups would then try to deploy um, a more proactive approach to healthcare, where you're, you're really going after healthcare versus sick care by getting to these patients long before symptoms when, when we think these biomarkers will enable um, these newer therapies to really keep this um, very debilitating disease of Alzheimer's in control for much longer prior to you know, the actual symptoms setting in. So there does appear to be some really important advances. You mentioned point of care. You know, I think the HDX is, um, is an all encompassing um, instrument right now. You put the, the sample in and you get the, the quantitated answer out for a multiplex. And we think that this is gonna be key for triaging patients once a drug is approved as well as a health screen that could be part of an annual physical to try to see patients much um, long, you know, long before um, the actual Alzheimer cascade would impair them. So we're very excited about this field, maybe before closing, if there's any other comments that uh, the group might have to further um, help the audience that, that we're gonna be sending this out to, to learn about how our biomarkers are gonna be making a pretty profound impact over the next uh, several years. You know, this would be a, a moment to, to, to give your comments. I was just going to say related to what you mentioned, Andreas, to have that closer, not only in memory clinics, that, that for me is already an advancement that we saw some talks uh, showing memory clinic data, like with a very heterogeneous uh, of patients that uh, uh, could be screened and could, uh, with the easy assessment and easy algorithms, they, including blood biomarkers and some more. Okay. You can distinguish if they are at risk uh, of develop, if they have amyloid pathology or not, but also uh, at home, as you mentioned, Andres, and there was an abstract showing the feasibility with our CMO NFL assay to use dried blood spots for that. So this is a uh, one example in which it would be very easy if you have an ultra sensitive technology such as Simoa, you can have the dried blood spots sent to a lab that has the HDX, and then you can have a lot of information from these biomarkers. So, so Paula, on, on that point, um, it's interesting, but if you go back and look at the payer group relationships that we've had over the last six months for COVID, a lot of what um, they invested in was getting samples from home and dry blood spots and saliva from the patients for our COVID assessments. And all of that infrastructure that we build out can be deployed and dry blood spots. And then we've known for you know, several of the Pyrene Precision Health Symposiums over the last three years, we've had a lot of NFL data being presented um, based on dry blood spots. And so I think this field um, of, of what we'll call home sampling doesn't actually require a point of care device. You can actually home care sample and then courier those samples into a central location where the HDX sits and within 24 hours, get an answer back. And, and a lot of this is trying to get um, samples so that people don't have to leave their homes, particularly in these times of viruses, when there's a lot of infection still you know, traversing and, and infecting the world. Um, having home care sampling is really enabled because of our sensitivity, because what we have found in these, these different trials is, is that the amount of of these different biomarkers that you find in a dry blood spot versus in the cerebral spinal fluid could be one one hundredth to one one thousandth the level. And so it's important to have this sensitivity to make the ability to have the answer come from less invasive samples. And this is a big advance that um, our sensitivity of Quanterics of Samoa is actually having a big effect on, and people don't normally understand it because they normally think, well, if you can see the biomarker in CSF, 
you don't need the sensitivity. But the challenge is, is that you want to be able to see it in a really low invasive sample, like a dry blood spot. And there's where the sensitivity is needed. And so by having our sensitivity, we're actually opening up major new addressable markets and making um, these technologies much higher utilization levels, much better utility for a test that can be done on a dry blood spot or saliva than, than on a, at CSF. And Andreas, you might want to comment more on this, um, this, this trend. No, I think you hit the, the, no, the, the nail on the head, I think. From my perspective, I think the excitement really lies that we see now discussions in the health economics realm, because by the end of the day, we need to understand how does this improve patient outcome and patient management and care in this more holistic way, uh, not just pharmacological intervention to the point. I think the excitement is also that we see we really know a group of diverse stakeholders to come together to really align on that mission. And I think this is where Quanterix really can be a catalyst beyond providing SE services and, and disruptive technology as well. So I think with, with these exciting times lie ahead and we're certainly happy to be the melting point of those discussions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also interesting, um, Andreas, getting control of the standardization of assays seems to be another field that is, is really knocking. Um, with NFL, Neurofilament Light, we actually, through the Pyron Precision Health Syndicate, teamed up with Uman, and then Quanterix ended up acquiring Uman, who had these very specific antibody pairs for NFL. And when you combine that specificity with Samoa's sensitivity to allow the less invasive sample, you can see why that standard of our NFL has become the standard. And we now have licenses with you know, many uh, companies like Siemens and others to enable that NFL to see its presence throughout the world in many regulatory um, channels and advances. So we have a lot of partners now supporting the standardization of our NFL assay, and we've made it central to many of our multiplexes. And I think that same opportunity um, seems to be available to us potentially for, for many of these phosphorylated towels because of our large syndicate of the Pyron Precision Health KOLs around the world that are deploying our technology, it allows us to create a standard. And if you have like 15 different NFL tests, it's hard then to figure out how one drug versus another drug is really acting on the body. And so if you can find the good antibody pairs and create a good standard, it helps the industry move the field. And you probably have spent a lot of time, you and Mark both in, in this point of, creating some standardization. I wonder if you could maybe make a couple comments around yeah, that. Yeah, so the generation of reference uh, material, we call it, and reference methods basically is really key here. And we've seen this in the space for ADA beta peptides to the point there's an effort undergoing now, some of this supported, so the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry, IFCC for NFL, and it's also advancing for PTAL. Um, I think, again, we're at the, really the transition out of our research into a really a very standardized clinical use as well. And then there is the component, obviously, of reimbursement and the health economics. I think all these different elements now start to come together. Awesome. Mark, did you have some other points to make around the standardization? I think you guys really hit the nail on the head just that, yeah, these standard materials with clear reference ranges and clear clinical cutoffs right, is going to really advance the field. And that's the next step. And really, uh, Samoa and Quinteras can play a strong role here as it's been doing with uh, Serum NFL. So Mark, I'll, I'll close this out um, with this uh, really wonderful panel. Really appreciate all of your, your insights and perspectives by just making a few more comments about how NFL's played such a major role in MS where there are, you know, 16 approved drugs. And in multiple sclerosis, many of those approved drugs allowed many of the neurologists around the world to basically run retrospective trials in pharma companies on approved drugs to show the linkage and the correlation of how those drugs advanced and lowered NFL levels in the blood. And by doing so, that then allowed the NFL to become a secondary surrogate endpoint, in one case, even a primary endpoint for a concussion trial because they had the retrospective trials on already approved drugs. In the area of Alzheimer's, there hasn't really been any approved drugs for disease modification. And so it's a little bit more challenging 
And that's why I think it's taken a couple more years longer than in MS for this Alzheimer opportunity, but it's really 10 times the size of any of the other, um, I'll call them neurodegenerative diseases, because once that that drug gets approved, there's going to be a need for triaging and then moving patients through health screens into these drugs. And you really have no chance of doing scalability with PET scans or CSF. And this is where having this sensitivity for a multiplex, where we can look at multiple biomarkers and even do it non-invasively, potentially through dry blood spots, is going to really enable the field to have the opportunity to actually have utility post a drug being approved to rapidly help uh, medicate those that can benefit from those medications um, earlier. So we're really excited about the whole transition of how we've done it with MS, it's now moving into Alzheimer's, of moving sick care, treating patients after symptoms to healthcare, treating patients before symptoms when it's much more efficacious. So thanks again for this discussion and uh, we'll be talking to everybody soon. Thank you.